Hello, everyone. Let's get started. And thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Chris Ott, and I work as the High Speed Rail Alliance's Deputy Director. Our Executive Director, Rick Harnish, is attending a meeting today, so I'll be running the show. Uh, but our Program Manager, Dylan Hayward, is helping as well. Uh, and for any of you who might be here for the first time, the Alliance is a nonprofit organization. We support elected officials and everyone else who is working for better trains. And we serve as a source of information about what high-speed rail is, its benefits, and how to achieve it. And in, in that, uh, we really appreciate experts like our speakers today. Uh, over the past year, uh, we've benefited from several really good talks from Deutsche Bahn, and we have two more DB speakers today. Uh, Jorge Rios is an electronic engineer with a master's in project management, uh, and he is certified by the Project Management Institute. He started his career uh, as a signaling and train control engineer. During his 27 years of experience then, since then, uh, Mr. Rios has directed railways and mobility projects in the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, Germany, and the United States. Uh, he's worked for companies such as Deutsche Bahn, Bombardier, Citexa, Siemens, NEC, and IBM. Uh, currently, Mr. Rios is Vice President of DB Engineering Consulting and Operations North America and was appointed as the Project Director of the California Early Train Operator in 2017. This ETO is assisting the authority with planning, designing, and implementing the, the United States' first high-speed rail program. And our second speaker is Mohammed Hegazi, PhD, who goes by Hegazi conversationally. Uh, he is a senior consultant at the Center for Net Zero Transformation in Rail and Transit with DVECO North America. Uh, Dr. Hegazi holds his PhD in civil engineering and has eight years of academic research experience, which focuses on the use of hydrogen for locomotive propulsion. Dr. Hagazi and researchers at the University of British Columbia are currently working on the retrofit of a switcher locomotive to operate using hydrogen, and they're doing this in close collaboration with Natural Resources Canada. He is also involved in developing codes and standards for hydrogen-powered locomotives. If you have comments, uh, any of you in the audience, if you have comments, um, please put them in the chat. If you have a question, please use Zoom's Q&A feature. Uh, because that helps us find the questions more quickly and get to as many as we can after the presentation. Uh, with that, let's get to the presentation and I'll turn things over to our speakers. Thank you, Chris, uh, for having us and um, hi everyone. So this, this question of zero emission rail propulsion is it, um, whether it is electrification, batteries or hydrogen, Chris, is something that has been coming to our table not only in our own operation, um, we, we set up um, in DV, in, DV we, in our own operation, we set up a very aggressive target uh, for supporting decarbonization of, of, of the rail transportation. We set a target that by 2038, we will be 100% eco-powered. And um, so this is something that we use not, not only in our own decision-making process, but we are we have been helping also some transit agencies in the decision making processes also for these technologies and uh, it's it's also um, becoming more and more relevant for example in the us um i don't know if you if you're aware in i think it was in september of 2022 the us uh, uh release what is called the national blueprint for transportation decarbonization and i think the target they were um, um mentioning was uh, by 2050. So we have similar targets and we have kind of the same kind of questions. So um, the idea is to have this uh, candid conversation and um, just to show a little bit of the advantages of these three different um, propulsion technologies for, for rail. So um, this, this is uh, choosing the, the technology or the propulsion technology. It's a multi-dimensional equation. So it's it's not only one point of view. So normally, normally when we are defining what kind of technology we will be using, then we have several points of view. The most important one, and this is um, kind of the core, but this is why we are doing this. It's the environment. And when we are um, taking the point of view of environment, we need to find out what are the available energy sources. Um, they, of course, they will need to come from, from uh, clean sources and the local air quality, quality regulations or the targets, as I, as I was mentioning before. And from the environment, there are two sides 
of the of the of these points of view. So one, it's the less energy that we use, the better. And the second point is the energy that we use has to be clean. So less energy and clean energy. From, from the operations point of view, um, we need to consider a lot of things as well. So depending on the specific rail application, um, we will need different, we will have different uh, power requirements. So normally the higher the speed, for example, then the higher um, energy that you will need to, to, to provide the service. Another thing is the range and the distance that I will need to, to travel without the possibility of refueling or recharging. And, and also connected to this, not so much the, 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 travel, the travel distance that I need to achieve, uh, but also from the operations point of view, how much time do I have available at the end of my trip to recharge or to refuel? So this, is, this is kind of, of one of the additional they mentioned that we need to, to look at. And finally, safety. So um, at this point of time, we, we, we can't do uh, refueling of the hydrogen, for example, in the passenger station. So we need to, uh, we need to build additional um, infrastructure just for refueling the hydrogen. In, in this case, for example, battery or direct electrification, they have an advantage because they can, they can be, this can be done in the station, the passenger station. For electrification, of course, we don't need it, but for the batteries, um, we can use the pantograph and we can charge the train um, in the station. Uh, the, other, the other point of view is what we call synergistic. And um, here I need to think is, is my system kind of an island, kind of a subway, uh, like a standalone system? Or do I need to consider to be interoperable with, with other systems? Am, am, I, am I planning to cross borders, for example? Another important thing is, uh, chair infrastructure, and this is connected to the right of way. In many cases, I am the train operating company, so I, I am providing the service with the train, but I am using somebody else's infrastructure. So I'm kind of a ten, tenant and landlord relation, a relationship. So uh, in many cases, as I mentioned, I could still want to run my clean trains. But the, but the infrastructure is belonging to someone else. And in some cases, it's, it's not feasible to invest my budget as a train operating company in the, in the infrastructure that is belonging to somebody else. And this, this is also the case in, in many uh, segments in the US where passenger service is using the private freight um, um, infrastructure. So, and finally, but, uh, but uh, one of the most important one is the economic point of view. And we're talking about LCC, life cycle cost. Also, also, we call it total cost of ownership. And here we need to look at operational expenditure, how much it costs uh, cost me to operate these, these infrastructure um, or these service. And the second thing is uh, how much it costs me to build it. This is cap capex or capital expenditures. And finally, um, commercial availability, not only of the technology, but remember that I will be having to implement this technology in an environment, and I need to be mindful of what kind of access do I have for goods and services to support my uh, propulsion system. Um, we need two things to, to be able to achieve our targets of 100% uh, uh, um, eco-powered. So we need to we need to use clean clean energy, so uh, the clean generation, this is what we mean. And in this case, we will be assuming, for this candid conversation, as I call it, we, we are assuming that the energy that we're going to be supplying to the three alternatives that we're going to be um, discussing today, it's coming from these clean um, energy sources, whether we do it from hydroelectric power plant or from wind uh, or solar farms, so we will be assuming that the energy is available um, at the substation or at the charging station in the case of the battery or at the electrolysis plant if we're going to be uh, doing with hydrogen. Um, a little bit later, my, my colleague Hegasi will be explaining, uh, we, will, we will be uh, deep diving a little bit in this, in this line, but as I said, for the, for the purpose of this discussion, let's assume um, that the three um, sources of energy are the same and are clean. 
In the other hand, then we need to have also clean propulsion. And, and in this case, uh, for example, the first technology that we're going to be discussing is um, direct electrification. And we are, we are here, the, the power is provided from the substation through the overhead catenary, through the pantograph, and then it goes to the, to the electric traction system, which is normally a converter, and then a, an electric drive. Um, this, of course, has the advantage that um, all the available power um, will be mainly used for moving passengers. So we, I do not need to carry additional weight or use additional space uh, in, in my train just to carry my own power or my own energy, and um, which is kind of the case of the battery. So the, the electric traction system in these two trains are more or less the same. The, the only thing is in batteries, okay, the, the energy is coming, as I said, from, from the, the um, power of the energy that I stored in these batteries. And in hydrogen, again, having more or less the same electric, tra electric traction system, I need not only to carry the fuel, the hydrogen, but I need also to bring on board the fuel cell, which is, which is kind of the system that will um, um, use the hydrogen to then generate the electricity that is going to the traction system. So in, in our own operations in DV, for example, 90% of, of all DV group passenger and freight transportation is provided electrically. So, and um, it, it does not mean that 90% of our network is, is electrified. We wish, we wish, but uh, the reality is that we, we have um, around 63% of our network is, is electrified. But we can achieve this 90% is because the sections with the most traffic, we do have them electrified. So when you wait the number of trains that are running in each, in each of these corridors, um, then, then this is how we achieve 90%. But remember that I mentioned at the beginning that the target is by 2038 to be 100% eco, eco powered. So for this, we need to keep electrifying. So we need to, we have a target and um, we have a target we, for achieving the target, we need to reach close to 75% of the network to be electrified. And, and also in the remaining section is then we need also to, to phase out all the diesel operations. All the diesel need to be replaced. And here is where the um, alternative propulsion system like hydrogen and batteries is where they have also a sweet spot in our own operation. Let, let me show you something that I, that I, that I think is, is, is very relevant for, for the conversation. So um, can, you, can you, Chris, confirm that you're seeing uh, not any longer my... Okay, so you're, you're seeing it. Thank you, Hegas. So this is, if you go here, this is openrailwaymap.org. And here you can play a little bit. This is, this is a free website. And you can, you can switch the views from infrastructure, speed, train control and, and electrification, even that is, is better. I think for, for illustration purposes, it's, 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 it's really nice. Um, let's look at the legend. Uh, black means not electrified. And then the colors um, is the sections which are electrified. And then the difference in the color is the, the voltage. For example, Germany is green. Uh, we use, let's say our standard in Germany is 15 uh, kilovolts. So you see that this is why Germany, which is here, is mainly green. And if I zoom in, um, you can see, for example, a more level of, uh, like a bigger level of details. And you see here that is 15 kilovolts. These black segments, it's what, where we still doing diesel operation. And again, we need to phase it out. And this is kind of the corridor. So we have a lot of work to do in Germany. Not, um, unfortunately, we, we, we are, I mean, this is a hard thing to electrify all these, all these uh, segments. And in some cases, as I said, uh, because of the specific conditions of the corridors, um, it's not becoming very attractive to do the electrification. So we are using all, all the other alternatives, always studying the, the, um, the alternatives. And it's not only Germany. You can see that uh, there is a lot of work to do, for example, in the UK, in France, in Spain. And if we just uh, go to the US, you will see that mainly, mainly all the main line of, of the US is still, still not electrified. We can see here if we zoom a little bit the Northeast corridor. And let me, let me quickly go to the West. 
if we zoom here um, close to the peninsula in San Francisco, um, you will see that here it starts appearing um, a red line, a Dutch line. Dutch means electrification under construction, and this is the Caltrain corridor that is, is currently uh, ongoing. So let me let me go back to, to the presentation. Can you see my presentation now again? So um, for those who have the opportunity to be um, um, with us, we, we had a delegation um, in, in Inotrans, in one of the biggest uh, railway um, fairs in the world, in, in Inotrans in Berlin. You will see that a lot of things were happening in, in this alternative propulsion system. And we in DB, as, as I mentioned before, we are working together with different manufacturers. So we have, for example, this is, this is a picture of the test of the train um, that we're testing with Alstom. And this is a battery train. We are testing it in, in the south of Germany. Um, this train has also the advantage that um, it's, it's equipped with a pantograph. So when the train is coming to an electrified section, or for example, in one of the station, it just raising the pantograph and it can start charging the, um, the battery. So this is an advantage because we do not need to build additional infrastructure for, for charging this train. Um, in this picture, um, um, we, we also announced uh, during Inotrans, um, we are working together in this case with Siemens and, and we are going, we, are, we already, we already did some, some um, test runs, but we announced one year of trial run of, of the hydrogen train also, also in the south of, this is south, um, southwest of Germany. Um, we also announced this trial run that is, is starting, not only the train, but also the refueling, um, the refueling equipment that we're testing. And the idea with this is that the hydrogen can be generated just, just beside the, the infrastructure. So we don't have to move the long distances, the hydrogen. And, um, and then therefore this will help us again, phasing out uh, many of the diesel operations that, that, we, that we have. Um, when, when we talk about, remember that I mentioned at the very beginning, the different points of view, when we talk about energy efficiency and, and, and the environmental, environmental point of view in, in two directions, not only using less energy, but then also um, um, by using less energy. This is connected to my, my utility bill, because using less also, also means that I am paying less for, for the power to move my passengers. So nothing to do, as I said, electrification is, is the golden standard. Um, let me show you what we did here. For this, for this presentation. So we took three trains. So the, the first one is a direct electrification and, and we already spoke about it. The second train is um, with batteries and the last one is with hydrogen. Um, we use in DV, we, use, we have different tools to, to support the decision-making process. And, and here we use Viriato. This is, uh, we build this uh, example in Viriato. This is a regional train, and I will explain a little bit why we have chosen this one. So we, we build the three trains into the, into the software. We did it at 80 miles per hour and a distance of 100 miles. And, and the reason why we did it is just because um, um, electric, elect, the, electric, the fully electric trains, they are capable to reach higher speeds, but we were willing to compare apples to apples. So um, we, we have chosen just 80 miles per hour for the, the three of them. And we chose, uh, we, we selected 100 miles of distance because we were not willing to also build into this chart um, the time of refueling, the recharging. So again, just, just to show the comparison between the propulsion um, systems. And why we build this regional train, um, and my colleague Hegasi will explain a little bit the impact of, of, of uh, increasing the speed, but we, ch uh, we have chosen uh, here the regional train because there is a case where the same train manufacturer is producing uh, in the market right now. They, they have the three, the three different technologies. So it's kind of the same series, but in different configurations. So they have electric multiple unit, battery multiple unit, and hydrogen multiple unit. Um, I don't want, I, I mean, I, I, if, if, you, if you just do a little bit of research, you can quickly find that the manufacturer, but I, I just don't want to, to mention the manufacturer just to keep it neutral at this point of time. So what is, what is uh, happening? For moving one passenger one mile, 
in the electric version, I need, I need, uh, or I will, I will use 20.5 watts. Again, this is kind of, kind of what we uh, also are used to pay in our utility bill. But if I were to move the same passenger for the same mile using a battery train, then I will need to use more than twice the energy. Again, this is not only having an impact in the, in the environment, but it's also having an impact in, in, the, in the OPEX, in the operational expenditure. And if I were to, to um, move the same passenger one mile in the hydrogen train, then I will need 125%. Um, so again, uh, this is why we are saying electrification is the golden standard, but the only point of view, as I explained at the beginning, is not only uh, OPEX and it's not only environment, of course, there's a critical point, but it's also um, what I was mentioning before, the total cost of owner ownership or the, or the life cycle cost. So in this chart, what, what we, what we uh, are simulating, this is for illustrative purpose only. So the other ones were coming from real simulations. This is just for illustration. So in this chart, in these axes, we have, as I said, the total cost of ownership, which is a combination between the cost of the capex, the cost of um, building the infrastructure, and the cost of operating the infrastructure. Um, in this direction, so I have um, service frequency, uh, traffic, and speed. So in this direction is high service frequency, high traffic, high speed. So what, what is happening here? This is electrification. So when I have when I have low, for example, a few trains, I have a few trains per day in, in this application. So, and I am dividing the cost, the investment in the infrastructure only in a few trains per day, then the total cost of ownership of these few trains, um, when, when I am doing the calculation per, per seat mile, then, then it's, it's becoming not very attractive. When I, as I said, when, when, when I am in the low uh, part of these, of these um, um, direction. But very quickly, very, very quickly, when I am increasing the frequency, when I am having more trains, when I have, um, of course, more traffic, and when I am increasing the speed, then uh, electrification, you will start dividing all these by, by millions of passenger and uh, passenger miles. So very quickly, um, the business case for electrification is super attractive compared to the other ones. And then if I put here hydrogen and battery, you will see that when I have, all, as I said, lower service frequency, lower traffic, lower speeds, then um, hydrogen and battery are having what, what I call the sweet spot. And these, in this region is where um, we are trying in our own operations um, uh, to use these alternatives to, to help us speed up the, the decarbonization or, or phasing out the, the diesel. So again, um, it's, it's not only not only the, the the traffic, the frequency, the speed, but also in many cases, as I said, um, like like in, in in the United States or in California, where the train service is not the owner of the infrastructure, there, there is also um, a sweet spot for this technology. Or also in many cases, remember, it's not it's not only building the, um, the electrification, it's not only building the the overhead catenary that I need to have power supply available nearby just to feed the, the substations. So with this, um, uh, I will um, transfer it to my colleague, uh, Hegasi, um, and he will, he will show a couple of interesting topics on uh, what is happening, for example, when we increase the speed. So let me stop sharing, Hegasi. Thanks, Jorge. OK, now let, let me try to share on my end. Here. Can everyone see my uh, slide okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Jorge. Uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, try to take a step back and uh, look at the fundamentals. Uh, Jorge started the presentation by saying that this is a very complex problem with uh, way too many uh, case-specific uh, practical considerations. Uh, that need to be accounted for before we can make a decision on what technology is uh, uh, best for that specific case and under those specific circumstances. However, uh, at first we must consider uh, something that applies in all cases, and that's the physics 
of uh, the, the propulsion system. Uh, without, uh, I tried my best to keep the number of equations as little as possible. Uh, and, and this is really something that uh, should, be, should be intuitive. Uh, you know, railway vehicles, just like any other vehicles, uh, have, uh, they, they must, uh, they undergo Newton's laws, right? They have to generate enough force to accelerate. Uh, so over here, let me let me pick my pointer. We've got a, a, a nice picture of a train right here. It's uh, traveling on that uh, tangent level track. So we are discounting the impact of uh, elevation. So it's not going up or going down, just to simplify things. Uh, for this train to move forward, it needs to generate more propulsion force than the uh, resistance that it's uh, seeing. And this is how you get acceleration when the net force is uh, in the direction of motion. Now, what does this resistance look like? Uh, the resistance for a moving train or uh, actually any other moving uh, vehicle has three main components. And I have, uh, I have an equation right here. R is resistance in uh, Newtons or in pounds force, uh, regardless of the unit, uh, equals A. That's a constant value. Right, that's uh, mostly uh, frictional and proportional to the weight of the vehicle, and then another factor is BV. So that is a factor that is proportional to the speed. So the faster uh, that your train is running, the more resistance you get, and that's mostly uh, dynamic resistance. So uh, your train is is running faster, so its wheels are spinning faster, which means that these wheels are uh, in contact with uh, the flange of the wheel and the rail are in contact more times per second so that increases as you gain speed and then lastly and and very important for this discussion is the aerodynamic resistance which is proportional to the square of the speed in this graph you really see the uh, uh the illustration of these three speeds so you see the a portion in green that's really fixed you can go as fast as you want that doesn't change and then you see the bv portion the the linear portion that just goes as a straight line with speed. And then as you gain speed, uh, most of your resistance then becomes this aerodynamic resistance because you need to push all the air out of the way uh, as the train uh, uh, goes forward. Now, just like in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in your car, uh, we need to consider two things when we look at these options, these uh, uh, alternative fuel options for uh, railway vehicles. One is power right here. And the other is energy. Power is uh, the, uh, your engine. You've got a, your car has a, an engine that's of a certain horsepower and has a uh, certain uh, size fuel tank. That's your energy content that you can carry around. Uh, power is a function of, uh, or is a product of force and velocity. So uh, if, you're, if you're going at the same speed, but you encounter a hill, you wanna go up a hill, you need more power. If you're going at a level track and you want to go at a higher speed, you need more power. So it's mostly related to performance, you know, and later when we look at uh, uh, some of the sim example simulations that we've included, you'll see that to meet these higher speeds, you need these higher powers. And then the other factor that needs to be considered is energy. Now, do I, I need to carry enough of this uh, zero emission option, this new fuel, for example, hydrogen, to complete my trip. Uh, I have certain service frequencies that I need to meet. I can't stop in the middle of the way. I have to stop in certain locations. Uh, so the, from a physics point of view, I need to meet my power and energy requirements. And these two go really highly. They increase uh, with speed. So at higher speed, you have more resistance to, to encounter. So you need more power. And when you need more power for a longer time, that increases your energy consumption. So uh, in the future slides, I want you to always think of power and energy. These are the two things that we're trying to uh, match or we're trying yeah, to get a certain performance out of a, a railway vehicle. All right. So speaking of energy, uh, different fuels have different energy content. Uh, the energy density, that's the, that's the term here. It's the amount of energy you can get in... Uh, whether by mass or by volume. So if I get a kilogram of hydrogen, how much energy is in that kilogram versus a kilogram of diesel versus a kilogram of uh, lithium ion batteries, for example. 
And uh, if I do the same with volume, if I have a liter of or a gallon of uh, of hydrogen versus a gallon of batteries versus a gallon of diesel, and uh, the really one of uh, it's really important because this limits how much you can carry because your vehicle has limited space and you don't want it to get too heavy. So your mass, the weight of the vehicle is restricted and the volume of the vehicle too. So you have very uh, a fixed volume and a fixed mass to fit energy in it. Uh, and uh, also you're, you're competing with diesel. So let me explain this chart right here. This chart plots the two uh, aspects of energy density. Uh, on the x-axis here, you see energy density per unit mass. So how much energy uh, this fuel can carry in a, in a kilogram uh, of, of that material. And then on the y-axis, you see energy per unit volume. Uh, generally, if, if the energy density per unit volume is high, that means you need less space to store um, the same amount of fuel. If it's low, that means you need more space. And uh, uh, I want to point out the difference between uh, batteries. If you look here in red, batteries have uh, much lower energy density than hydrogen, for example. But then I want you to look at the comparison with diesel. And uh, as my colleague Jorge just mentioned, diesel is uh, the main way that uh, railways are being propelled in uh, North America right now. So this is really, you know, if we're, we are trying to meet the performance of diesel right now with these new zero emissions options. Uh, keeping in mind this big gap in energy density. Uh, another thing to uh, caveat perhaps in this slide is that uh, it has efficiencies built into it. So this energy density of diesel accounts for the uh, efficiency of uh, the diesel engine. This uh, of hydrogen accounts for the efficiency of the fuel cells that convert the hydrogen to electricity to propel the train. And then this uh, energy density of batteries accounts for the efficiency uh, of uh, batteries as well. All right. So now that we, we we know that we need power, and we need you need you need enough power to meet, for example, your top speeds or to meet an elevation requirement, and then you need to store enough energy to complete your trip. What do these look like if I have a uh, uh, sort of a high speed configuration? So if I want to, if I want to go at uh, uh, if I have a seven car train set, this is a, a result of a simulation, a seven car a high-speed uh, rail train that is traveling 300 miles at a maximum speed of 200. And this isn't a real uh, route. It's just a, a simulation exercise. So I have point uh, starting point at zero miles, ending point at 300, and top speed of 200. Meet the 200, but don't exceed it. And let's see, we want to compare these three options in terms of energy intensity, which is, uh, which is uh, what Jorge discussed in his uh, earlier slide. Now, overhead electrification has a massive advantage because it keeps all the energy and power uh, off board. You don't really, there is no fuel tank and you are connected straight to the grid. Uh, you can access very high levels of power, which enables very high levels of acceleration and top speed. And at the same time, you don't really uh, have to reserve any of your space for fuel because your fuel is from the grid. Uh, and that makes the energy intensity, which is the amount of energy spent to transport a passenger, really low because all your train is, is full of passengers. However, if you compare that with batteries, uh, batteries act as both the engine and the fuel tank. So you need to store enough batteries to meet your uh, uh, power requirements. And for high-speed rail, that's these are very high requirements to be able to achieve those high speeds. And you also need to store enough batteries that you can complete your trip. Now, using the energy densities I showed in the previous slide, you would need out of a seven-car train set, uh, you know, five and a half. So most of your train is transporting these batteries just to complete this trip. And this is this is mostly why, uh, although it is possible to build battery trains for high-speed rail, it is generally not a, not a very good idea because it limits the amount of passengers and you're mostly holding batteries. And, and you can see now that it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You can get the same story with hydrogen, but uh, the, the difference with hydrogen is that the hydrogen gas is your fuel. That's the fuel tank. And the fuel cell is your engine. So the fuel cell is responsible for power 
and the hydrogen gas uh, in, in these green cylinders is responsible for energy. So you can kind of see uh, at, at those speeds and at these distances, what really is the impacting factor? You couldn't see that with batteries because they, they do both jobs. They give you the power and they're also your fuel tank. Now, with uh, a high-speed rail configuration, because of the amount of power that you need to reach such high speeds, you will need about four of the seven cars just to transport your engine because of the, the size that this fuel cell takes and the amount of power that you need. And then you'll need about one and a half cars for the, for the hydrogen fuel. That's your fuel tank, which gives you somewhat similar numbers of energy intensity. That's energy use per passenger transported per seat mile, uh, comparable to batteries. Now, I want to extend this uh, simulation exercise to look at uh, different speeds and different distances. So right now, this case right here is 300 miles at a maximum speed of 200 miles per hour. All right, so let's see at the same maximum speed, what happens if I wanna travel different distances? Does the, do the numbers change? Over here, I have a graph that plots energy intensity in what hours per seat mile, again, from that simulation exercise, versus distance. And I'm looking at 100 miles, 200 miles, 300, 400, and 800. Let's see what, uh, you know, what range limitations we get. And let's compare the three technologies. In blue, you have OCS, which stands for Overhead Contact System. That's electrification. That's direct electrification. And then in red, you have batteries. And then in green, you have hydrogen. Now, this is a simulation, again, at 200 miles per hour. So the power requirement is, is kind of the same on all three options. Uh, now, you could first thing you can tell from this graph is the energy intensity for the blue line is much lower and uh, significantly too. The other thing you can tell from this graph is that uh, the blue line is constant. You could travel longer distance. You just need to extend your electrification network. If you have the infrastructure, your energy uh, usage per seat mile doesn't really change. You could travel a, a million miles. That's still the same. Because you don't need to carry your fuel and therefore replace uh, passengers or revenue vehicles with uh, vehicles that or cars that carry the fuel. Now, the picture for batteries is uh, very different. If you can, first of all, what you notice is that it's much higher than the blue line, which is not good. And the other thing that you can see is that it, uh, it shoots up very quickly. It's kind of exponential. Uh, which meaning that at higher distances, uh, you need to pack so many batteries that you're, you're transporting very little passengers. The other thing that you, uh, that you can notice is that it has few points. So here I've got one, two, three points for the red line versus uh, five points for the blue line, meaning that at, after 300 miles, your whole train would be batteries. You would transport no passengers. It's, not, it's completely not feasible anymore. Uh, the, the picture for hydrogen, uh, especially when you look at it compared with batteries, is different. Uh, in the beginning, at, at uh, low uh, mileage, hydrogen has a higher uh, energy intensity. And the reason for that is because most of the cars, regardless of how much, uh, how long your trip is, the length of the trip really is a function of or impacts energy. Uh, the speed is fixed, and that's your power. So all of these three technologies have to meet the same power level, and now it's a function of like how much fuel are you carrying to meet these distances. But you can tell that there is an intersection point between the hydrogen and the batteries where the energy intensity now for hydrogen is becoming less than the batteries. And, and this already tells you that there are sweet spots for these technologies depending on the circumstance, the range, the top speed, uh, and uh, uh, the service frequency. Now, now we've looked at uh, a, a certain fixed speed, 200 miles per hour, and we looked at different distances. Now, how does this picture change if I change my speed? I mean, high-speed rail is not the only type of rail. Uh, does the picture is the picture different at uh, lower speeds? Over here, I've got the same graph repeated for different top speeds. So again, energy intensity in what, hour, what hours per seat mile versus distance for the three technologies at 100 miles per hour top speed, at 150 miles per hour top speed, and at 200 miles per hour top speed. That's the one we just looked at in the previous slide. 
First of all, you can see the blue line is fixed in all cases. I mean, it goes up at 100 miles per hour. It's less than 100 at 150. So you can see the blue line increases, but it's within that same uh, maximum speed, it is fixed. And the second thing you can notice is uh, there are more points with batteries uh, than at, at 100 miles per hour. So you get all five points. Yes, that's this final point at 800 miles is uh, has a really high energy intensity, which isn't good, but it's still feasible. So that means not all of your seven cars are batteries. You're not only hauling batteries now. You're mostly hauling batteries, but you still have some passengers. Now, when you go to the 150 miles per hour drawing, uh, for the same red line, you could see that it has less points, meaning that its range now is limited to 400. So it couldn't go to 800 anymore. It, it can only go to 400. And lastly, here at the 200 miles per hour, it only has three points. So now you're, you're seeing with the with batteries that our range is uh, reducing. That our uh, Before we need to put all seven cars uh, to just simply store batteries. The other thing is, uh, you can tell the same stories with the green line. So hydrogen is feasible for all points uh, at 100 miles per hour. Its energy intensity really shoots up if you go to 150 miles per hour and then if you go to 200 miles per hour, as well as its number of points. So hydrogen is still feasible at 800 miles at 150 miles per hour, unlike batteries, which stop at the 400 mile mark. Uh, however, it, the energy intensity really increases. When we go to 200, we see that it can no longer even meet these distances. So the battery uh, graph stops at 300 miles and the hydrogen stops at 400. And you can also see the intersection points you know, are different. So over here, they intersect at about 400 miles. Uh, over th here, they don't even intersect because the batteries don't even uh, make it. And then here, you can see the intersection is uh, like the 250 mile mark, something like that. And mostly, this is mostly because you need such high powers and uh, you need to transport such a high amount of energy to complete your trip that you, your train ends up being mostly made up of this new fuel because its energy intensity, or sorry, energy density is low. It doesn't have enough energy per unit mass or volume. Okay, now all these energy numbers that we've looked at, look at the tank to the wheels. So you, the tank is your hydrogen and the wheels are your wheels, your train wheels. But this energy that, that's at the tank has to come from somewhere. Some uh, technical terminology, the tank to wheel, just uh, very descriptive, uh, explains you know, energy usage from your, the vehicle tank, or in, in the case of electrification pantograph, to the wheels. And then there is another term that I want to introduce, which is the well to tank. Now, this energy, I need to generate it. I need to transmit it. Uh, and this can involve a number of steps, which reduces the efficiency because you, you, your energy is made up here. Let's assume renewable. It's at 100%. You've got 100, 100 kilowatt hours of energy here. That's not what reaches your tank because of the inefficiencies in the uh, transmission, for example, and, and, and production. If we assume uh, renewable energy, and if we compare the three different technologies, electrification, uh, batteries and hydrogen, and we consider the well to wheel. So both the well to tank and the tank to wheel combined, because that would increase your energy. You know, if your energy intensity at tank to wheel is high, your energy intensity from the well to the wheel would be even higher. It needs you need more energy to uh, transport this passenger. For electrification, and these numbers are very case specific like mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, they depend on uh, what type of uh, renewable do you have? How far is it? Do you need to, to transport solar 3,000 kilometers or 1,000? Very case specific, but generally for electrification, it's between 10 and 60%. So in the worst case, 10% of the energy you generate at the source gets to your wheels. And in the best case, it's 60%. Now, for batteries, you get kind of similar numbers. They vary a little bit because mostly they, you're still uh, dealing with electrons. When you go to hydrogen, you're dealing with protons now, uh, you need to generate this hydrogen. So, for example, through electrolysis, that takes uh, energy. 
you need to compress it, you need to transport it, and that really drops down the uh, well-to-wheel efficiency from um, to be to be between ten and twenty-five percent. Uh, so twenty-five, and the best case scenario, you get a quarter of your energy that you generated right here in the start to to be at your wheels to move your train. Now, with this being said. I want to say that energy efficiency, this well-to-wheel energy efficiency, is, is a consideration, but it's not the only one, because of the uh, high energy density of hydrogen compared to batteries, as, as we limit ourselves to zero emission options, meaning that you can store, with hydrogen, you can actually store enough energy to uh, meet certain services while you're not even able to store this energy with batteries. So they may be more efficient, but their energy uh, density is so low that your, your range is really limited. And at that point, you know, you need to meet your range. You need to complete your trip. Um, and with, uh, with this, I'm going to uh, hand it to, uh, to my uh, colleague, uh, Jorge, for the concluding slides. Jorge? Sorry, I was I was um, speaking speaking by myself for, for a few seconds. So let, let me check here quickly the the screen. Um, we 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 just got through the conclusions, and then I believe we open it for for questions. But, um, can you can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So just kind of of a conclusion. It's again this is a multi-dimensional equation, and um, what we show here what just Many of these, even some of the, some of the chart that we show here, are case specific, meaning they are coming from a real simulation. Um, but many of them are just for illustration. So remember, we 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 define four things: environmental, operational, uh, synergistic, and economical. And in general, as well, uh, in terms of um, environment, in terms of operation, um, there is nothing better better than electrification. But in a specific cases and in, in many of these applications, then there is there is a lot of room for alternative propulsion systems like uh, hydrogen and batteries. And 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 there, there was a question. I was just looking even even a question about having um, kind of a combination of these. But anyway, then if we want just to come with a specific recommendation, then here is when we need to okay take the equation. Take the tools that, that we need for the decision making process and then start filling the specifics of, of each uh, application. So, um, and with these, um, Chris, I'll hand it over back to you um, so that, uh, that we open the for the questions, I believe. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, there is a lot of information uh, that you've shared and uh, we have a lot of questions too. Um, but before we, just before we get to those, I, I, you know, when you are presenters, you may not be able to follow along and, uh, and I hope you see that there's some praise and thanks in the, in the chat and the comments. So uh, we, we appreciate what you, what you just shared. Uh, and on, on that note, um, Sarah asks uh, a question that we often get, uh, will these graphics and video be available after the webinar? Uh, yes, uh, we actually keep an archive of the recordings of, uh, of, of these talks on our website at highspeedrail.us slash events. So you can go there anytime to check out past events, including some, uh, some from, from DB. Uh, here is a, a, a sort of a big picture question. Uh, how much can the decision to use these zero emissions propulsion systems you've described rely on cost savings over time and other advantages like that? And how much does it simply need to be a policy choice to decarbonize? Yeah, uh, this is this is a hard question, but um, yeah, and maybe maybe I didn't put here in in the point of view the the policy. I agree. It's um, in many cases um, we have these targets of decarbonizing, and in some cases we we cannot just. I mean, we don't have the time enough uh, if we want to meet the targets. In some cases, we don't have the time enough to electrify. So. Sometimes we need to choose um, one or the other solutions um, by, by, by policy. This is, uh, I think this is happening everywhere, but uh, yeah, but uh, as I said, we always like to try to use a, a rational from, from the physics more than from the policy, but, but again, 
the policy is an important uh, in, in maybe in, in the next version of this yeah. i will add the policy as, as one of the points <laughs> okay, which is completely <laughs> relevant uh, of course no, no question uh -huh. okay great thank you um the next question uh comes from philip and um and i and i believe it was in uh Higazi's portion of the presentation we you did talk about resistance but um uh, philip asks uh, another at another level of detail is the net aerodynamic resistance per train affected by the train's length the answer is yes However, um, uh, the more significant factor is the uh, the frontal uh, area, the cross-sectional area, and that's why these high-speed trains will have like a very long nose, and they're generally shorter or closer to the to the ground. Just like when you uh, when you buy a uh, one of these sports cars or uh, the ones that go really fast, you have to be more aerodynamic, just like airplanes as well. So it's all about the square area that's really. You can imagine the air is sort of fluid, like moving in water, and you need something sharp to, to cut that fluid. Okay, great. Uh, Howard asks, is there any possibility of hybrid power sources uh, similar to hybrid automobiles, like batteries plus fossil fuels? I, can, uh, I guess if, if I, I, I want just to take a little bit of this, and then you, you, can, you, you take it from there. Um, this is this is I, from my point of view, I don't like a lot of these uh, uh, these combinations, um, because there is a minimum minimum amount of equipment that you need to put into the train. So if you if we are going to put not only the equipment that the minimum equipment that we need for hydrogen, and then we will put the minimum equipment that we will need for batteries, then most probably uh, from the efficiency point of view, it's not going to be very attractive, but this is a good example of, of the, remember that I, in synergistics, I was talking about interoperability. So maybe it's a great case of having different, uh, different propulsion systems that will allow you to, uh, um, let's say, to, to go through many, many applications. But from the point of view of the efficiency, I will not be so much a fan of this solution. But hey, guys, please. What I was going to say is uh, it, it's definitely possible to build uh, uh, hybrids with combustion engines, but uh, it's no longer zero emissions. Uh, it's maybe low emissions. It's better than having just the diesel engine, but you still have uh, emissions at that point. So it is possible, but not a zero emission solution. Okay. Uh, thank you. Anthony asks uh, whether it's possible to charge batteries in motion. Is 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 that viable at uh, at high speeds? Um, in other words, you know, trains would mainly be electrified, but would have a small battery so that catenary can be avoided in difficult sections, like in a tunnel or something like that. Yes, definitely. Uh, the term is discontinuous electrification. Uh, you electrify. Um, uh, for example, an uphill uh, part of your of your trip, and you can use the electricity from the catenary to power your train and charge your batteries, and that definitely has some use cases, and that would be considered uh, zero emissions. Okay, great. And uh, uh, Hagazi, I saw that you started typing an answer to this uh, question in the in the Q and A. So maybe I'll just uh, ask it out loud. Diane asks, um, "Do the propulsion options continue to hover close together as you shorten the distance to around forty miles, for example? Understanding that overhead catenary is 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 ideal." For the presented case, uh, yes, because uh, in the pre we we changed the top speeds and the distances, but the, we kept the power requirement for the high speed uh, to be able to call it high speed rail. So they all have to meet a very high power requirement. And that's why they, uh, if you shorten the distance, they all get closer together. Because essentially, when you shorten the distance, what you're saying is uh, power is now my main constraint, not energy. I don't need to carry energy with me. I just need to meet this uh, power requirement. So they will get closer. In reality, the, the, it's, it, it's again, uh, case specific. It depends on what's your uh, what is now your power requirements. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Charles asks uh, this question: What are the relative maturities of the supply chains for these different propulsion systems? Are they all ready for development today, uh, and which have the best track record so far? So. 
there, there are implementations of these technologies already. And uh, Jorge led with some examples uh, from DB earlier in the presentation. Uh, however, uh, overhead electrification was, of course, the most mature. Uh, it's, it's been around the longest. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, after that would come batteries and then hydrogen. Um, the track records are uh, successful, but not too many for these new technologies. That's the, this is the end. So, so, so far it's been good, but we don't have a lot of samples yet. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, in the... Um... This this question may get into policy again, and you know if you don't want to address that uh, in in today's talk, that's fine. But um, in the in the California context, one question asks: Does it make sense not to electrify the Capital Corridor and other feeder regional rail services? Um, again, we will need to to review the details, but um, um, I think the Capital Corridor is our good examples of what I was mentioning before, the passenger service or the trains who are the train operating or the train companies who are train organization who, who are providing the passenger service are not the owner of the of the of the corridor. So I am assuming that there is an additional additional um, variable into the equation that will need to be solved. It's um, I believe more complex agreements just, just to be sure if it is doable or not, because as I said, I um, um, as, as I said, just a part of, of what we discuss about the policy. But uh, if you ask from the operations point of view or from the environment point of view, I will electrify. But, but then again, it's not only these considerations that there are these ownership of the of the right of way. And um, and uh, for example, in the case of the capital corridor and um, ACE, there are the number of trains per day are it's it's not so high. So it could be that uh, when we build these and we do the calculation, that, that it's it's going to be more favorable and will make more sense maybe to use hydrogen in this case. Okay. I think we have time maybe for one more question. Um, and this one, uh, this one has to do again, I guess, with the maturity of these technologies. But what do you foresee? Uh, for uh, in terms of the future of the the energy density of batteries, I mean, is it possible uh, for those to get closer to the energy density of fuel cells or, or diesel, or does that uh, are we already kind of running up against the laws of uh, of chemistry and physics? Now, questions about the future are ones that you always get wrong. Uh, <laughs> I uh, there recently Toyota announced. Uh, uh, breakthroughs in solid state uh, batteries that uh, have uh, are inching closer towards the the hydrogen uh, realm of energy density. Uh, I, personally, I I think it's it's going to be very difficult to get close to hydrogen simply from a from a physics point of view. Uh, however, uh, uh, there are some uh, you don't need to match hydrogen. Perhaps you just need to meet a certain minimum. Um, so I, I remain, uh, my conclusion remains that for heavier vehicles and for longer distances, uh, batteries still have, uh, some time before they can, um, if they ever actually are able to meet these, uh, distances and heavier vehicles. And, and you can, uh, you can kind of see it even from, uh, road vehicles. Uh, most of, uh, most of, if you buy, uh, any EV, they're kind of limited at like 400 miles because you run into a bottleneck. Uh, you have to add more batteries to to uh, to uh, increase your distance, and that makes your vehicle heavier. And that now you're spending energy to move these batteries, and there's a, like a law of diminishing returns simply because of their low energy density. Uh, so um, uh, fingers crossed. Okay, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's just about the top of the hour here, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But thank you again, uh, Jorge and Hagazi. We really appreciate this. And, and thank you uh, to everyone who's attended. Um, as, a, as a nonprofit organization, the Alliance depends on the support of our members. So if you haven't already, please join the Alliance or, or donate again. You can do that online at highspeedrail.us. Uh, the next talk that we plan will explore the cost of transit projects in the United States. We'll get that on the calendar soon, and you can find out exactly when if you are signed up for our weekly email newsletter. 
Uh, and if you're interested in signing up for that newsletter, uh, if you haven't already, and or if you're interested in seeing past talks, uh, including the recording of this one, um, uh, or, or previous ones from DB and other presenters, you can go to highspeedrail.us slash events. Uh, but for now, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.